Welcome back everyone to another edition of Seahawk Central News, the top source for UNCW's campus news, entertainment, and sports. I'm Janae Randall. And I'm Sarah Lively, reminding you that you can always stay tuned to Seahawk Central News, which is available 24-7 online at youtube.com slash tealtv2010. This week, you will be taken on a tour of Wilmington's famous Bellamy Mansion, along with catching up on all the Halloween news around town. We will also catch you up on sports with Ben Tyson and the rest of the Seahawks sports team, along with the latest movie reviews from Chris Vickery. Seahawks Central News starts right now. Major parking changes are happening in downtown Wilmington, so don't forget to bring some extra cash next time you hit the downtown scene. The City of Wilmington Council members have voted on increasing the price of parking tickets, fees, and meters due to an $800,000 shortfall in parking funds for the city. The increase in price will be sufficient to fix the current budget issues, but the feelings about price increases are mixed within the community. One of the biggest changes include collecting fees in all parking decks 24 hours a day. The changes will be taking effect within the next three months while the City Council continues to monitor and debate further changes to accommodate the budget downfall. There is a lot of talk on campus about Dirty Mega. You may have seen The Rock by Wagner Dining Hall painted for it last weekend. But what exactly is it and how did it get started? Our reporter Laurel Cervicki went to get the answers to these questions and more. Thanks Sarah. I'm Laurel Cervicki here with Jason aka the permanent vacation crew. Um, Jason tell me a little bit about the Dirty Mega and what kind of got it started. Uh, Dirty Mega is a party every month that we throw. Uh, it's myself, Lord Walrus, World's Greatest DJ with uh, my crew permanent vacation which is a bunch of DJs, um, rappers, uh, designers and so on. Uh, one of my homies here, C Mills, repping the party. Uh, it's at Soapbox, it's the last Thursday of every month. And it's just a big party. We get a couple hundred people to come out. Um, we have lights, photos, dancing, like lots of dubstep, house electro, rap music. So it's a big, fun party. In my opinion, the best party in town. <laughs> Did you guys do anything um, this past weekend for Halloween? Uh, yeah, it was Halloween Saturday, so it was perfect. Uh, we had pretty much everybody come out in costume. So it's kind of like a normal big party, but adding all the funny costumes that people wear. So it just turned it into a much bigger and much funner party. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And yeah, normally the parties last Thursday every month, but in November, it's November 19th. So we can avoid Thanksgiving because that's not a good time to throw a party. So November 19th is uh, the next party. Very cool. Well, Jason, thank you very much for coming out here thank today. You. And I'm Laurel Cervicki with Till TV. Back to you, Janae. UNCW's Sigma Alpha Omega sorority helped bring awareness to a needed cause. Last Friday, SAO hosted an ovarian cancer midnight 5K run to raise awareness for a disease that is often forgotten in the midst of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. The run took place on the UNCW campus. All proceeds are going to the Ovarian Cancer National Alliance in Washington, D.C. Now let's go outside and see what's up with Rachel Nagel on this week's Talk on the Walk. I'm out here on Chancellor's Walk, and as the school year progresses, there are many students that are finding concerns with the way that parking is handled on campus. Let's ask them what they think is working and what's not working, and what sort of suggestions they can give to the parking police to improve the situation. Parking is pretty good around where you live if you live on campus, but the whole after four, not really sure of where you're allowed to park. A lot of people have gotten tickets. Um, just because it's not clear where you're allowed to park after four or if that's even a rule anymore, I don't even know. I'm in zone one, never find parking on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's pretty terrible. I uh, paid a lot of money and unable to park. It's pretty awful. My thoughts on campus parking are there really aren't too many visitor parking spots for people that have friends that want to come over or by who don't have passes themselves. I don't park because I don't have a car and I don't have a car because of parking. I live on campus and this is my car. I don't really have to worry about parking and that saves me $350 a year. 
my thoughts about parking on campuses. I think you ought to let older students that live closer go ahead and drive over because this bus ride is crazy. I think campus parking, they do a really good job um, just enforcing the rules and things like that. They do get a bit strict, but mostly between campus police and the parking people, they, I think they really do a good job of keeping our campus safe. There's a lot of mixed emotions about how parking is enforced on campus. Perhaps auxiliary services will now push for streamlining their rules and regulations in order to clarify what parking enforcement really means on campus. Until next time, I'm Rachel Nagel for Seahawk Central News, Teal TV. The biannual UNCW Rocket Pitch event was held Tuesday, October 25th at the new Hanover County Development Center. The event featured four Wilmington-based entrepreneurs and one from Columbia, South Carolina, who were able to complete eight-minute presentations in hopes of gaining the attention of investors. Center director Jonathan Rowe told the Wilmington Business Journal that $5.2 million has been invested in several of the 26 companies that have presented at the event since 2009. UNCW's version of the cash cab has caught the eyes and ears of many students across campus. But just what is it that makes this cash cab so special? Seahawk Central News reporter Brad Crawford brings us a story. The cash cab is a great asset to our school and is sponsored by the crossroads of UNCW. The cash cab gives students a ride to their destinations while asking them a set of questions pertaining to a different topic each month. This month, the cash cab focused on awareness in regards to alcohol, drugs, and even sex. In order to find out the prizes given to those who win, you'll just have to find out by taking the cash cab out for a spin. Find out the prizes given to those who win, you'll just have to find out by taking the cash cab out for a spin. Alright, thanks for riding with us on Cash Cab today. Make sure you follow Crossroads on Facebook and Twitter and you can get updates all the time. The 17th annual Kukaloris Film Festival is quickly approaching as it will be upon us next weekend. However, hosts are needed to house the award-winning filmmakers attending this year's festival. Most filmmakers will be attending screenings and events all day and night, so really all that is needed is a warm bed and hospitality. This adoptive filmmaker program has become a Kukaloris tradition and has created lifelong friendships between filmmakers and their hosts. If you are interested or want more information, please email the Kukaloris Development and Outreach Coordinator at development at we now have a special treat for our viewers. Our reporter Jill Capadano has brought us a musical guest in this week's Seahawk Spotlight. Many of you walk by the Fisher Student Union on a daily basis while heading to or from classes or running to get a bite to eat. You may have noticed a student in the past few weeks who sits on the same bench with his guitar singing some songs. Well, I have the pleasure to meet the man behind the guitar in the studio today. Welcome Cameron Doyle. Thank you for being on our show. Yeah. Um, the first question that I want to ask you is, how long have you been playing your guitar and songwriting and singing? Well, I've been playing guitar for uh, seven years. I taught myself how to play. Um, I also taught, taught myself how to sing. Uh, I've been working on it for six years, and I've been listening to albums and singing along with those guys. So that's kind of why my voice got similar to like the guys in Blink-182 and the whole pop-punk genre, because that's what I listen to. So. Being out there, when people pass you, have any, has anyone stopped to comment on your singing or your guitar playing or give you feedback? Or has anyone dropped some money in your case? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely people come talk to me every day. Actually, I, re I really enjoy doing it, and that's uh, the main reason why I still do it. Um, even it's been like four weeks, and I'm still doing it almost every day because you meet the coolest people doing it. I mean, I've met other musicians. That's how I met all the guys in my band. That's how I met, like, we met our band's manager, the guy we record with, our booking agent. That's how we met everybody. Uh, the band that we're supposed to tour with, you know, in summer of next year. We're, uh, so it's exciting. It's, it's really cool, and, it, and it's kind of amazing that we've been able to accomplish all of this just by, like, me sitting on a bench playing for tip money. It's kind of amazing um, that all this has happened, and I love meeting people. So it's been really cool. So I've walked by you a few times, and I know that you sing popular songs that are on the radio, and I recognize some of the songs that you're singing. Do you also write your own songs? Do you have any original songs that you sing and you play as well? Um, absolutely. Yeah, I write my own stuff. Um, and that's part of the reason why I love this band that 
um, we've been able to put together is because you have me, Chris, and Ryan, who all play guitar, and we all also sing, and we're talented enough that we all are able to write our own music. So we're tossing around ideas every time we meet up, and we have so many ideas going, and we're able to, to write songs really easily, and it's a blast, it's a fun process to do. Um, I just usually play covers because I love Blink. They're my favorite band of all time. And a lot of the time, you, you, I just feel like you can't go wrong playing stuff by them because as a college student, you know, everybody knows at least one song by them. Mm -hmm. And they, they write really great stuff. So I, I do it just because I enjoy playing it. But every now and then, I'll slip in original stuff. And people will come ask me who wrote it. And I'll say I did. And, and you know, I like the feedback from people. Cool. So you do, you're out there for the sheer enjoyment of playing for your, your peers at UNCW? Yep. That's awesome. That's the whole how reason many I do it. How many days are you out in front of the Fisher Center a week? Um, on average, I would say maybe uh, five days a week I'm out there. And then the rest of the time when I'm not there, I'm usually in front of WAG playing. So Cameron, have you and your band, have, have you had any gigs up to this point? Zero. Really? You Not played no gigs? Nope. Well, I'm happy to announce that Cameron and his band are here, and they will be playing their first gig, and they'll be playing an original song for us and for the TLTV viewers. We'll be right back with Cameron and his band. Well, she's a punk rocker with an iOS agenda. She took an RPG to the Board of Education. She's got your heart in one end with a grenade pen in the other. She's got her daddy's eyes with her mother's resolution. She said, I'm not broken, cause I know just where I stand. I always got loaded in, so you better sleep with what I open. This past Sunday, Beckwith Recital Hall, located in the Cultural Arts Building, hosted An Evening with One Tree Hill. The hit show, which has aired almost 200 episodes, is saying goodbye after nine seasons on television. The question and answer session featured all regular cast members from the current season and the show creator, Mark Schwann. About 75 seats of Beckwith's 280 were filled by UNCW students who were in the arts discipline and able to buy tickets for five times less than the general public. Although tickets were very limited for a seat actually in Beckwith, a live stream to Lumina Theater allowed One Tree Hill fans to watch the session. One Tree Hill is the longest running TV series in Wilmington history and is scheduled to finish shooting in mid-November. Seahawks Central News has been granted an inside interview and tour of downtown Wilmington's Bellamy Mansion. Here is Katie Nemerich with more. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm here at Bellamy Mansion, a historic landmark in downtown Wilmington. I'm here today to interview one of the employees of the mansion and to get an exclusive tour. Let's take a look. I'm here with Braxton Williams, Director of Operations at Bellamy Mansion. C what can you tell us about this mansion? When was this built? Well, uh, construction was begun in 1859. We actually have a, a, a slave quarters on the site that was uh, uh, completed in 1859 to house slaves that built the, the mansion. Uh, construction ended in February of 1861, just a few months before the outbreak of the Civil War. Oh, wow. and how long did, was this mansion occupied actually by the family? It was actually continuously occupied by the family until 1946 when the youngest daughter, uh, Ellen, died here. She was 93 years old, never married, never moved out of the house, just always lived in the house. And so it's actually never been known by any other family other than the Bellamy's and the nonprofit that owns it now. Um, the house is funded in several ways. Tours are our number one source of funding. Uh, $10 a head, slow and steady wins the race. Um, uh, uh, tours are our, are our number one source of income. But we also rent the place for weddings. Uh, we have um, uh, fundraisers here. We just had our 150th birthday party. 
Uh, there's Art of the Table, there's Art of the Wedding, uh, uh, Family Fun Day, African American History Day. Uh, these, uh, and the last two particularly, fulfill not only our uh, fundraising requirements, but also our educational mission. Ultimately, this house is about, we are a nonprofit, we're not here to make money, we're here to save the house and to educate people about, um, well, our, our, our um, uh, title is the Bellamy Mansion Museum of History and Design Arts. Uh, we're trying to educate the public about preservation, uh, architectural building techniques, the history of the, history of the time, things like that. I hope you all enjoyed your exclusive tour of Bellamy Mansion. I would highly recommend coming downtown and getting a real life look at it. I'm Katie Demerich with Seahawk Central News, Teal TV. Now let's head over to the sports desk and check up with Ben Tyson and the rest of Seahawk sports team. Thanks, Janae. After exciting students and fans in the community at Midnight Madness, the Seahawk basketball team held a Navy and White scrimmage game the next weekend. The teams played three minute, three ten minute quarters. The Navy squad was coached by assistant and one-time interim head coach Brooks Lee and assistant coach Andrew Gray ran the White squad. Coach Peterson split up the players in hopes of finding any flaws in his lineup. He got an even better chance this past Saturday as the Seahawks hosted their first exhibition game of the year. Our stellar reporters Ariel Lappin and Sway Thompson were there with two cameras, so let's see the top plays. Freddie Jackson with the steal finds Tanner Milson in the corner who hits the open three. That's good. Moving on, Keith Rendelman would take the ball at the other end of the court and slam it home and run back down the court. He played great D all day. Moving on here, Freddie Jackson to KK Simmons, the freshman, looking like he was shooting BBs there. Then Keith Rendelman misses the first attempt, puts it back for the layup. We would move on to Keegan Pace finding Dante Morales, shakes the defender off the glass, looks just like Tim Duncan. Dante putting the moral in Morales this year. Then KK Simmons, the tough layup at the basket. That's good. A little bit later, we have Dante. The no look pass to Cedric Williams in the post is good. Williams wasn't done, though. He gets the That was an and one play. Williams gets it here. Fader. And that's good. A little bit later, Freddie Jackson, the new Hanover product, the bounce pass to Adam Smith, the freshman. Freshman combined for 36 points in the game. And a big block there by Cedric Williams. He had four in the contest. Here, Keith Rentelman. This was the put away dunk. Put it away. Game over. We had two cameras there, so you can check it out again. It goes Dante, Cedric. Tanner, Keith, final score, UNCW 80, St. Andrews 69, Realman and Morales, top performance, Trevor Loach, not pictured, but the coach did speak about him. Uh, I think I've, I've, I've met with Trevor, I'm going to keep meeting with him, that it, uh, it's just some of his intensity level I don't like out there right now. He's got to, he's got to play faster, he's got to run the floor harder, um, he's, to, to me he's not doing that right now. And, uh, for, we, we need him to pick it up a little bit. I've always said Trevor's one of these guys and it's time to play, he's there, but I want him to work hard in practice. The Seahawks improved to 39 and five all time in preseason games, though it wasn't the easiest preseason task of Trask they've ever had. St. Andrews led 34 to 33 late in the first half. Both the men's and women's teams play their second exhibition game of the season on November 6th at home. Head coach Kelly Van Houten announced the UNCW softball team's 2012 schedule last week. The team opens the season on February 10th with a home doubleheader versus North Carolina Central at Bozeman Field. The team will also host the Seahawk Classic from February 24th to the 26th and face East Carolina in another home doubleheader on Wednesday, March 28th. Finishing off their nine-meet homestand on October 22nd, the UNCW men's and women's swimming and diving team dominated with a 217 to 81 margin and a 182 to 118 margin respectively to win versus Emory. Strong performances by Valtteri Haldanen who finished first in four events and captured individual titles in the 100 and 200 backstroke as well as Anna Munger who captured two relay and two individual titles in the 100 and free. Both Munger and Haldanen were recognized with CAA Swimmer of the Week honors so congratulations to them. The Aquahawks traveled to Blacksburg, Virginia this past Saturday, where unfortunately the winning momentum did not translate on the road as both the men's and women's teams were upended in all three meets on Saturday against Duke, Virginia Tech, and Florida State. The men now stand 2-4 and four on the year, while the women are 4-5. and five. 
In women's tennis, the team qualified a program best six singles players in the main draw on opening day at the Intercollegiate Tennis Association's Women's Carolinas Regional Tournament played in Chapel Hill this past weekend. Yes, that is the name of it. The doubles team of Olga Blank and Kelly Cameron also made a mark on the tournament. The pair advanced to the round of 16 but dropped their match against NC State's doubles duo. This weekend was the 2011 Halloween Women's Tennis Invitational held at the UNCW Tennis Courts. The Lady Hawks aced the competition in singles play, capturing a 7-love record. Overall, the Seahawks commanded the court with a 14-2 finish in singles and 6-3 in doubles. The girls were able to put together two days of quality play, giving them the title for this year's Halloween Invitational. Switching sports, the UNCW volleyball team improved to 11-16 overall and 4-6 and in conference play after beating George Mason at home this past weekend. Christy Late had a 34% attack succession rate to go along with 22 kills and a tough three games to two victory. The scores of the games were 23 to 25, 25 to 20, 25 to 23, and 15 to 13 in the final. It doesn't get any closer than that, folks. Junior Jennifer Mallard recorded 16 spikes and more, freshman Morgan Klein had 14. On the defensive end of the court, sophomore Haley Collins had 28 digs and sophomore Courtney Porter added six blocks to go along with nine mercs, a less violent alternative vocabulary word than kills. Feel free to use it. The team returns to action on November 4th at Virginia Commonwealth University. The men's soccer team struggled in three consecutive close losses. Last week, VCU came into town and came out victorious 1-0. The goal came on a pass from Jason Johnson that a Seahawk defender deflected into his own goal in the 64th minute. That weekend, the team traveled to Towson, Maryland, but fell to the Tigers 2-1. Towson picked up the lead in the 49th minute on a goal by a fellow named Olan Kunle Banjo. I couldn't make up a name like that. And Thomas Driver responded by scoring his third goal of the season just 54 seconds later. Freshman Jacob Von Kopernol picked up an assist on the play, but it wasn't enough as Towson scored again in the 64th minute. Thanks to Phil Martinelli's strike, Brandon Miller had six saves in the defeat. However, the Seahawks didn't hold their heads at all, coming back the next weekend to fiercely battle the Delaware Blue Hens at the Seahawks Soccer Stadium. Jack War scored. Ward scored his third goal of the season early on a penalty kick, but it was matched in the 54th minute by John Deenan of Delaware, scoring on a PK resulting from a UNCW handball. The game went into overtime until Vincent Mediate blasted one in from the top of the penalty box. Final score, Delaware 2, UNCW 1. The Seahawks fell to 3-12-1 and and overall and 1-8-1 and in league play. The women's golf team and Landfall Country Club hosted the Landfall Invitational this past weekend. Our very own Ariel Lapid was there. Here's a report. Hello, this is Ariel Lapid reporting from the Country Club of Landfall's Jack Nicholas Golf Course, where the UNCW women's golf team hosted the Landfall tradition this past weekend. The tournament, celebrating its 10th anniversary, drew a powerhouse field of 18, 16 of which ranked in the top 40, from SCC reigning champion Auburn to ACC conference champion Carolina and Michigan State from the Big Ten, a very competitive field of play was assembled. We talked to Coach Ho during media day to find out more about this staple in the fall slate. The tournament itself is one of the most prestigious collegiate events in the country, and it gives our UNCW golfers an opportunity to play against the best teams in the country and the best players. And uh, the, here at the Country Club of Landfall, it is um, you know, a great venue. It's a very demanding test. Uh, the course is in championship condition, and it is uh, uh, just a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to compete at home against some of the best teams. The Purdue Boilermakers captured the title with a three-round total of 40 over 904. Auburn took second over Ohio State by one stroke at 54 over 918 to State's 55 over 919 holes. In individual standings, Purdue's Paula Retta won her first collegiate title by three strokes, shooting two over par, giving her 218 overall. For the Lady Hawks, Sophia Hugson tied for 13th place. Overall, UNCW turned in a card of 969. Till the next time, I'll see you on the green. This is Ariel Lapid with Seahawk Central News, Teal TV.
And in one final NASCAR note, Tony Stewart passed Jimmy Johnson in the closing laps to take the win at Martinsville Speedway. Stewart is now eight points behind Carl Edwards for the chase lead. Johnson is slowly fading from the chase, now 43 points out of the lead with three races remaining. The race at Martinsville had one million more viewers than the same race a year ago, giving the sport a healthy momentum boost for the final part of the season. The three remaining races are at Texas, Phoenix, and the season finale in Miami. Well, that's all for now. Keep on keeping on. Calling all Harry Potter fans. Some of you may be disappointed about the conclusion of the Harry Potter films. However, you can relive all of your favorite moments next weekend in Lumina Theater with friends. The Association for Campus Entertainment, also known as ACE, will be holding the Marathon That Must Not Be Named on Saturday, November 12th, beginning at 1 in the afternoon. Each of the movies in the Harry Potter series will be aired back to back, and part two of the finale will begin on Sunday, November 13th at 9.37 a.m. Students may stay for the entire eight films, or they can come for any particular movie they would like to see. Those who are planning to come the entire time are encouraged to bring anything that will keep them comfortable throughout the films. The event is free, and be sure to stop by the ACE office in CAKE if you have any further questions. Now that you've heard what is going on campus, it's time to hear what news comes from the big screen off campus. Here's Chris Vickery with Critics on Campus. Thanks, Janae. Welcome everyone to Critics on Campus, where we review the latest movies in the Wilmington area. I'm your host, Chris Vickery, alongside my co-host for the day, Alexa Regiment. We did two movies as always, and the first was The Thing, which is a sci-fi horror thriller about an alien that takes human hosts and basically starts attacking all of these people in the Arctic of all places. Um, what were your thoughts? Was it scary? Was it interesting? I mean, I mean, it's interesting because usually I don't watch sci-fi movies or go to see them, but it definitely was entertaining for me. It kept me on the edge of my seat. I thought it was interesting how I was kind of always waiting to see who the alien was because you really had no idea at any time anyone would just pop out and start attacking people. So in that aspect, it was really entertaining and I enjoyed it for the most part. Yeah, and it, it operates well as a contained thriller where everyone is stuck in one place yeah. and, and conflict just really rises until the very end. And there's a lot of good surprises, some, some good special effects, and overall an, an entertaining watch. But uh, I personally think it fell a little bit flat just because it, it didn't really break out from a lot of the genre conventions. Right. Um, but out of five stars, what would you give this one? I would probably give it a three. It wasn't... It wasn't bad, but it wasn't great. It definitely was entertaining, though. It did what it set out to do, which was nice. So I have to agree with you. It was a, it was a solid movie, but didn't do anything special, so I'd give it a 3 as well. The, uh, the other movie, however, was Paranormal Activity 3, which broke all kinds of records at the box office, uh, very much along the lines of Poltergeist, mm -hmm. a classic uh, thriller horror story. Um, with, so, with some interesting aspects to it. But what did, what did you think of that one? You know, compared to the first two, it was definitely a lot scarier. There was a lot more going on. I didn't even find the first two very scary, but this one I definitely was... There were scenes that made me jump, which I liked, because I like scary movies. But still, I'm always waiting for a little bit more with the Paranormal Activity films. I feel like they could definitely do more to make it a little bit scarier. And it, this is one of those films where... It, to build up the suspense, they have a lot of scenes where nothing happens. And yeah. it feels kind of like watching paint dry from now and every now and again. But the scares when they hit are really scary. The suspense is, is palpable. And they really set out what they, or they did what they set out to do. And it, it was an impressive film overall. But uh, out of five stars, what would you give this one? I would give this one a four because it was scarier than the other two and it was a pretty good thriller. So because of that, I'll give it a four. I would give it a four as well. It definitely broke the mold from the other two and it's broken a lot of records and a lot of people are enjoying it. So it, it, it earned that four. Yeah. Um, that's all we have for this week. Uh, once again, this segment is brought to you by Carmike Cinemas. Stay tuned next time for more reviews of the latest movies coming to the big screen. Once again, I'm your host, Chris Vickery, alongside Alexa Regiment. See you next time. Well, Seahawks, that's all we have for you this episode of Seahawks Central News. Remember, you can keep up with Seahawks Central News 24-7 by stopping by youtube.com slash tealtv2010. Be sure to check out the latest edition of the Seahawk in Atlantis at newsstands all over campus. Special thanks goes to the Communication Studies Department and UNCW-TV for making our show a reality. I'm Janae Randall. And I'm Sarah Lively saying so long, Seahawks. Ready?